Hi, everybody. Um, this week we are doing chapter 14. And chapter 14 is all about fluids and pressure. Um, so it kind of naturally divides into two different um, topics. The topic that we'll be doing today is all about atmospheric pressure and um, how to determine the pressure when you are exposed to air or water. So how the pressure changes as you go up in the atmosphere or how the pressure changes as you go under the ocean. Um, and then the second part, which we'll do later in the week, is really all fluid mechanics and the idea of an ideal fluid and how we can find some, um, determine some of the quantities of interest about fluids and how they move, um, how flow rates can be determined, things like that. Um, so there's gonna be a few things that we need to talk about um, to begin with, a few preliminary things. Um, the one warning that I will give is we're gonna have pressure and density, which density is a row, but it looks a lot like a P, and we're gonna have velocity and volume. And a lot of these things, um, it's really easy to mess up and write something that's I mean you mean something else. So we'll see that. I'm sure I'll probably write P when I mean density. I'll try not to. Anyway, so let's get started. Um, the first thing we really need to talk about, which we've kind of defined and talked about before, but is the density of an object or a fluid. So recall that density, which we use rho for, um, is the mass of an object over volume. And in this course, we're always going to assume that density is uniform. Um, so density will be a constant. It'll be uniform. Um, that's not very physical. In fact, if we think about the air, the density of air as we rise up in the atmosphere actually decreases. The density of water, even in a swimming pool, water is more dense at the bottom than at the top. Um, but we're going to assume, to make our equations easier, as a first approximation, that the density is uniform. Um, so a few things about this. Um, the biggest problem is that volume, um, we need to understand the volume of whatever we're talking about. So remember that if we have a cube, volume can be broken up into, and I'm not going to do the integral, um, but the area of this surface times the height. And the area there would be whatever length times width you have. And obviously the height is the height. So this really translates to m over area times height. For a cylinder, we would have some area, and then we'd multiply that by the height to get the volume. So this area would obviously be pi r squared, depending on whatever r this is. We assume r is constant, and we have a cylinder with a volume of pi r squared times h. Um, just keep that in mind as we go along. There's going to be times where we're going to need to figure out the volume as area versus height. Um, so the density is the amount of mass over the volume. All right, there's a few common densities that are going to come up over and over again in problems. You're going to have to know them. A lot of times, uh, Wiley Plus will assume that you know the density of air or you know the density of water. So let's talk about what these are. They're also useful for you to know when you do um, chemistry or thermodynamics or any type of, of um, normal science, I would say. Common everyday science. So the density of water is usually given as, I would say, one gram per centimeter cubed. In um, chemistry, one centimeter cubed is actually commonly referred to as a milliliter. So um, the density of water is usually 
thought to be one gram per centimeter cubed. We can turn this into kilograms over meters cubed, which are the SI units. So the, the standard units would be kilograms over meter cubed if we're referencing forces in Newtons, things like that. So <clears throat> as a reminder, there are a thousand grams in one kilogram and there are a hundred centimeters in one meter. If we cube this and we multiply this by one gram per centimeter cubed, we obviously get uh, this is a one times 10 to the six over one times 10 to the third times kilograms meters cubed, which gives a value of a thousand. So, um, sorry. So if whichever way you can remember it, water is got a density of a thousand kilograms per meter cubed or one gram per centimeter cubed or one gram per milliliter, um, whatever works for you, but remember that you need to write it this way. Our book for whatever reason is oddly specific and writes the density of water as 0 0.998 times 10 to the third which is 998 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, I don't know why it's oddly specific. 1,000 is fine. Um, use either one. I don't really care. The reason why we care so much about the density of water is almost all liquids, unless they have like a lot of viscosity, like syrup or something, pretty much have a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, so if you're talking about a liquid and you don't know the density and you want to assume it's water, you're probably not going to be that far off. In contrast, the density of air is 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. <clears throat> so you can see that the density of air is about one thousandth that of water. Um, that's because there's far fewer molecules of oxygen or hydrogen or nitrogen or CO2 or whatever have you in the air than in water. Um, that's pretty obvious from experience, but this is air. Uh, in general, it's useful to know because as humans, we do most of our experience in air or experiments in air. I should also note that this is for a pressure of one atmosphere at 20 degrees Celsius usually. Um, for us, that's not super important, but if you were doing an experiment in a chem lab, you might need to know uh, what the pressure on the water is or what the temperature is or whatnot. Um, there are actually uh, equations that can tell you how density changes with temperature, but we're not gonna consider that in this chapter. So, Big takeaway, density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Density of air is 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, you're often going to be assumed to know that. Okay. So the real point of this chapter is, or at least this half of the chapter, is to talk about pressure and how pressure changes in environments. Uh, there's a second thing that we're going to need to know, which is the acceleration um, or buoyant forces. but for now, let's talk about pressure. We've already seen pressure. We saw it when we were talking about um, stress and elasticity, that the pressure was actually force over area, which was something called um, this hydraulic strain coefficient times the change in volume over volume. Um, you don't need to know all of this, but this part right here is the important part. So, the pressure is equal to force over area, but that area is actually a perpendicular area. So imagine we had a sheet of glass and you were pushing equally on all parts of it with a force um, F. This glass has a normal vector that's equal to A perpendicular, and the A perpendicular is just the area of the glass itself. So if this is a length and this is a width, then the pressure being applied by this force is that force divided by the perpendicular area that the force um, 
is hitting, okay? If it were a cylinder of force for some reason, being applied downward through this area, right? The, the perpendicular area is just the cross-sectional area of the cylinder, which is pi r squared. And if the force was evenly applied there, then the pressure would be the force over this A perpendicular, okay? That's easy enough to understand, I think. Um, usually, what we're gonna talk about is perhaps a human being on the surface of the Earth, and there's this force due to the column of air down on the head of the human. And so when we talk about the air pressure on your body, usually what we decide is it is equal to this column of air or column of water pushing down from above onto you or whatever is pushing up. Um, that's not too important at the moment, but know that basically, if you think about it this way, when you move up to the top of the atmosphere, there's no air up there pushing down on you. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But um, the main takeaway is just this. Pressure is force over air. Pressure has been studied for a long time, a very, very long time. And because of that, there are many, many different units of pressure. Um, you're familiar with probably most of them, uh, believe it or not. But for SI, the units of pressure are what are called Pascals. So the Pascal, which is force over area, is Newtons per meter squared. Um, that's pretty much obvious, right? But a Pascal, it turns out, is a very small number, um, one Pascal by itself. So it's mostly useful in chemistry or biochemistry or biophysics. When we're talking about things on a micro scale, a scale of 10 to the minus six, um, what we're more familiar with is atmospheric pressure. And one atmosphere, which is the pressure at the surface of the earth, is equal to 1.01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, okay? So a single Pascal is one times 10 to the minus five atmospheres, very small. Uh, pretty large when you're in the micro regime, but very small when we're talking about human um, experience. Um, one atmosphere is the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the Earth. Okay. Next thing that you're probably mostly familiar with is something called pounds per square inch or PSI. So in British units, forces come in pounds and um, if we do force over area, areas in square inches, this 14.7 PSI, right, is equal to one atmosphere, which is equal to 1.01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So basically in your car, car tires, car tires are usually um, inflated to about 30 PSI you're looking at two atmospheres or two times 10 to the fifth or 200,000 Pascals. Um, but remembering this, that the air pressure has a pressure of about 14.7 PSI at the surface of the earth. Um, what that means is if you inflated a tire at 14.7 PSI, it would equalize with the air pressure outside. Um, and Usually we do double that so that the tire gets good contact and all that good stuff. But for now, if you can just remember about 15 PSI per atmosphere is what you're talking about. If you're in a lab and you go to 60 PSI, 60 PSI is about four atmospheres. Um, it's about four times the pressure that you would feel in the air at the surface of the earth. So the next one I wanna talk about is something we almost never hear anymore which is called a tor, and a tor is also called a millimeter of mercury, MMHG. We're gonna actually do this later on and show why this is what it is, but 760 tor 
are equal to one atmosphere. So they're equal to 1.01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. And finally, one bar is about one atmosphere. Okay, it's, it's like one times 10 to the fifth Pascals exactly. So um, what you're gonna see is if you do homework or you find questions in books or you're doing chemistry that often you'll be given pressure as atmospheres or PSI. Um, when you're looking at the weather, meteorology um, often gives pressures, atmospheric pressures in millimeters of HG or TOR. Um, it really just depends on what you're doing, what scale you're using. There's reasons for all of these. Um, but generally in air pressure, you see PSI and um, like diving and, and space and stuff, you see atmospheres, but we're going to use Pascals, okay? And the most important thing to remember is usually this, that one atmosphere is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth and further that at sea level, at sea level, uh, the pressure is one atmosphere. So the pressure is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth. Um, Let's talk about a little bit about this. We're, the first thing that we're gonna try and figure out is how do we determine the pressure change if we start at say point one or at point A and move to point B, or we start at point A and we drop to point B. So maybe this is rising in the air. You're in a balloon and you rise up and you wanna know what the air pressure is at B. Or maybe this is your in a boat at the surface of the earth and you drop down 100 meters below the waves and you wanna know what the pressure is there. So we need to come up with some way to determine what is the change in pressure, meaning what is the difference between pressure at B minus pressure at A or whatever. Our equation had better um, match what we know from experience. And that is, as we go up, we start at a pressure here of one atmosphere. And as we rise up, eventually we get to the point where there's no air and the pressure is equal to zero. And as we go down, we start gaining pressure. Okay, two atmospheres or three atmospheres or four atmospheres as we drop. All right, um, again, this is due to the column of material above you. So as you drop into the ocean, things are gonna change because you can get more and more water, basically pushing you toward the center of the earth. But this tells us that as the pressure change, as we go up, okay, that means that the change in height goes up. What does the pressure do? The pressure is going to fall. So the pressure falls as we go up. And what does the pressure do as we drop? it goes up as the change in y drops. So it better match this idea. We better get that the change in pressure is dependent on whether or not we rise or fall with y. Um, that should make sense if you've ever been at the bottom of a swimming pool, you can already start to feel the pressure on your body. One other thing I should say is, honestly, the pressure is coming from all sides equally on a body, if you're in the air, every part of your body, all your skin feels this pressure of one atmosphere on it, but we're assuming top and bottom pressure. That's what we're worried about, okay? And in fact, we're gonna derive this equation or expression in two ways. One is the way the book does it, and one is the way that I would like you to think about it because it saves you from trying to figure this part out. This is actually where the problem lies, it's determining this delta y. So um, let's do it the way your book does it first. Um, we're gonna derive it the way your book does it. So imagine you have underwater, so you're just barely underwater, and you have a cube of water in the water. This water has the same density as the water. And so the top, there's an area, and at the bottom there's an area, and those are even. The top of this is at what we're gonna call Y1, and the bottom is at Y2. Now, what are the forces acting on this cube of water? Well, there has to be some force on the bottom that's pushing it up, which I'm gonna call FB. 
And there has to be a force due to the water above it trying to push it down. And I'm going to call that Ft for force at the top. And then as always, there has to be a weight. Okay. And if we assume, assume that this is not moving, we can draw from this free body diagram with A equals zero, that MA is zero, where M is the mass of this whole cube, is equal to the force at the bottom minus the weight minus the force at the top. Now, what are these forces? So recall that the pressure at any point is the force over area, or that the force is the pressure times the area. So for F at the bottom, I'm gonna call FB F1, um, sorry, F2, and I'm gonna call um, FT F1. And the reason why I'm doing that is I want Y2 and F2 to match. So my variable um, at the bottom is two, therefore the force, force at the bottom I'm gonna call force two. My variable at the top is one, Therefore, I'm going to call the force at the top one. And the weight is where things get a little tricky because this is mg as normal. But remember that density is m over v, and therefore m is the density over v. And this density is going to be the water, the density of water, okay? Because that's what this object is made of and it's what it's moving through. So this becomes the density of water times V, but the density times V is the density times the area times the height, okay? And remember that we're going to go down, right? So we're starting at the surface, Y is equal to zero. So the height is um, a negative height, and it goes from Y2 minus Y1, uh, what I'm trying to say is, if I tried to measure something with a height of y1 to y2, I would measure h as y2 minus y1. However, I'm going downward, and y2 and y1 are considered negative. They're both negative. So with a little bit of trickery, um, this is going to be, uh, in fact, Let's look at it really fast. Um, FB is F1, so we write that zero is P, I'm sorry, F, P2A minus uh, this, whatever this is, uh, minus the weight, minus P1A. So um, from this, we see that P2A is equal to the weight plus P1A. And now um, we can see that if we do y1 minus y2, okay, this would be going down. You would get that the height is negative starting from here to here. So you get y2 minus y1 is negative height. Flipping the sign, you get this. So this becomes p2 times a is equal to mg plus P1 times the area. That means that the pressure times this area is the force. Um, and that also means that P2A is equal to rho times A times Y1 minus Y2 times G. This is an MG. We've supplemented or substituted the density of water times the area times the height times G and P1A. Now notice all of these have a one in them. So if I kill, or I mean all of them have an A in them. So if I get rid of the A's and I put this as P2 minus P1, which is the difference in pressure that I wanted, moving that over, I get rho times G times Y1 minus Y2. This right here is our equation for finding the pressure difference given some height change. Um, we need to double check that it actually works. Um, and how we're gonna do that is we're gonna take a couple examples. Imagine you're at the surface of the earth and we just said that P2 minus P1 
must be equal to PG Y1 minus Y2. And this seems a little weird. So let's make sure it actually gives us the correct number. As you go up, okay, in the air, pressure one, and at some point at Y2, at a height of Y2, you're at a pressure two. We know that pressure two has to be less than pressure one. That's because there's less air up there. So pressure two must be less than pressure one, and therefore the delta of P, which is P2 minus P1, had better be, had better be um, negative. Therefore, rho G times Y1 minus Y2 would better give us a negative number. Now we also know that Y1 is less than Y2, and from that we can see that rho G, Y1 minus Y2, is in fact going to give us something negative. Let's say Y2 was 10 meters and Y1 was zero, sea level, we would get negative 10 times rho G. So that works fine. Does it work okay the other way? So let's say we're dropping below the ocean. Um, we can actually check this in the air, but it's gonna work in the air as well. Here, Y1 is gonna be zero. P1 will be atmosphere. At some point, at some depth, where Y2 is equal to some depth, we get that P2 minus P1 has to be positive. The pressure at the bottom is greater than the pressure at the top. There's more stuff above you pushing down on you, therefore this has to be positive because um, pressure two will be greater than pressure one. Therefore, <coughs> rho G times Y1 minus Y2, this has to be um, positive as well. If this is positive, this is better be positive. Well, Y2 is actually at negative D because we're going down. And that brings up a point that I really should have made earlier, but we always assume Y is positive up away from the center of the earth. So this would give us PG, Y1 is zero, minus a minus D, PGD, which is positive, okay? What that's really, really saying is that the change in pressure as you go up decreases, okay? So the pressure two is equal to the pressure one minus uh, rho G times H. And when the pressure change goes down, as you go down, P2, is equal to the initial pressure that you're measuring plus rho g times the change in height, the magnitude of the change in height, right? Which should make sense. You're getting more material above you, so the pressure's changing because you're getting a greater force of the weight above you of all that stuff above you pushing down on you. That's kind of how to see it. The only thing you need to remember is, um, that y is positive up, okay? And by up, I mean away from the center of the earth. And um, that at sea level, p is 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. The last thing that you need to remember is the density is the density of the medium you're in, okay? You can see that here because we're adding the density of the water times G times H to give us how much more stuff is above you or how much less stuff is above you. So um, the density isn't the density of the object, it's the density of the medium, the fluid. By fluid, I mean air or gas that you're in that's pushing on you, that's creating this pressure on you. So as I said, there's a better way to derive it than all this stuff and this weird stuff that your book does, uh, we've already done energy. Remember when we did energy, we set the initial energy equal to the final energy, and we had a bunch of terms. Um, let's say that we only had potential energy um, and kinetic energy. Remember we did MH, MGH1 plus MV1 squared over two is equal to MGH2 plus MV2 squared over two. And setting those equal um, let us figure out 
different variables. We're going to do something very similar. Um, but you probably know from your high school science or previous science, chemistry, physics, that in thermodynamics, an ideal gas has something called PV is equal to nRT. Sometimes this is um, given as some other constant. But this PV, what is pressure times volume? So pressure we already noted was newtons per meter squared and volume is meters cubed. This gives us units of newton meters, which are energy. So I maintain that if you write the pressure at point one times the volume plus the potential energy due to gravity, mg times h1, um, we can change things to y's, which we will in a minute, times the pressure at two times v, plus m g h2, you will get our pressure equation that we just derived with the book. Um, remember that because density is m over v, m can be written as density times volume. We're assuming in all of these problems that our volume is not changing, okay? And I'm going to say that h1 is y1 and therefore h2 is y2. Let me rewrite this. So I get P1V plus rho of the water times V times G times Y1 is equal to uh, the pressure two times volume plus rho times V times G times Y2, okay? If I cancel V in each of these, I get P1 is equal to P2. I'm gonna move this Y1 over. Um, Actually, I'm gonna move it that way. Um, so this is plus rho times G times Y1 minus Y2. And I see here that I get P2 is equal to P1 um, plus rho G Y1 minus Y2, which is exactly what your book derived um, for this. Uh, except we derived it using that kind of pseudo energy idea that the pressure times volume plus the potential energy of gravity, when we move from a position A to a position B, let's say, gives us the pressure change. Um, I'm gonna rewrite that a lot cleaner right here. Um, so P2 is equal to P1 plus rho G, y1 minus y2 and it doesn't matter if we go up or down we just need to know what y1 and y2 are and then we can find p2 assuming we know p1 um, this also is often written like this um, the change in pressure is equal to the density of the fluid times g times the change in y with a negative sign okay where the change in y is y2 minus y1. If I put a negative sign, this gives me y1 minus y2. And the change in pressure is p2 minus p1. So the change in pressure only depends on the uh, density times the height times g for a column of, of fluid above you as you move up or down. Um, it's a pretty simple equation. It actually is super useful. We're gonna use it in two ways that right now that I hope you find interesting. Um, some of you may ask yourself, uh, how high does the atmosphere go? Like how big is the atmosphere around the earth? And it turns out we can actually use this question and what we've learned so far to figure out how big the atmosphere is. It could be one small problem here. Um, air isn't uniform, and we'll talk about that for a minute. But um, we had that P2 minus P1 was equal to G times Y1 minus Y2. And if we're at the surface of the Earth, where P1 is one atmosphere, and our Y1 is zero, we then move up to a point where P2 becomes zero. We wanna know where the atmosphere, there's no atmospheric pressure on you, there's no air pressure. 
and we want to find what this y2 is. Um, recall that the density of air we said was 1.2 times uh, 1.2 kilograms meters cubed. And from this information, we can figure out how high the atmosphere rises from sea level. Um, let's put in a few of our numbers. This will be zero, this will be zero. We're gonna solve for Y2, the negative signs go away. So we get that Y2 has to be the pressure at sea level divided by the density of air times G. And we know the pressure at sea level was 1.1 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. We put one atmosphere here, we'd have to change it anyway. Put it in SI units. Uh, the pressure of air we said was 1.2 and G, if I assume it's 9.81, what do I get? Um, turns out that what I get is 8580 meters, okay? Um, there are 1609 meters in one mile. So this ends up being about five miles. So the atmosphere ends about five miles above sea level if and only if air had a constant density all the way up. Obviously not true. Um, the air is much thinner at the top than at the bottom at sea level, but it ends up being that, okay, maybe double that. Maybe the atmosphere is 10 miles. Um, I don't remember exactly what NASA defines the atmosphere as, um, but um, we can find five miles, and five miles is pretty good. Uh, we know it's going to be a lot more than that, but the air pressure is going to be a lot, lot smaller, probably unmeasurable at some point. Okay, um, that being said, how much of the Earth's radius is atmosphere. How does the atmosphere compare to the Earth's radius? Well, remember the Earth has a radius from the pole out of about 6.4 times 10 to the sixth meters. This is 1.6 times 10 to the third. It's literally a fourth um, times 10 to the third less, right? So this this is insignificant compared to the radius of the Earth. The Earth, the atmosphere would just be this little tiny layer that you couldn't even probably see um, over the surface of the Earth. The atmosphere is not very big. Um, even doubling that, tripling it, wouldn't, wouldn't change that fact much. But the point that we're taking away from this is that we're just using this equation we need to be able to um, figure out our variables and our pressures and our heights and know the density of whatever fluid or gas we're in. Uh, but it's really just plug and chug stuff, um, honestly. Okay, um, the second question that I asked here is what is the pressure in the deepest part of the ocean? Because I wanna go the other way. Um, so, let me tell you that the depth of the deepest part of the ocean is 10,994 meters. Um, if we were to reach that depth and say a submarine, what would the water pressure be on us? Okay, so here we're going to start assuming at sea level and drop to a final height of 10,994 meters. And we want to find the pressure here. We know the pressure at the top is one atmosphere, and we know that Y1 is sea level, therefore it's zero. We should also state that this is a negative, right? Y2 is negative 10,994 meters. And our job is to figure out what pressure two is. So we had from before P2 was P1 plus rho G Y1 minus Y2. And we can see that this is going to be zero, okay? This is gonna be one atmosphere. We know that this is gonna be a negative. So what we get is we get that P2 is equal to one atmosphere plus the density of water times G times a minus times a minus or a minus times a minus 
times 10,994 meters, okay? This is 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. This is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed times 9.81 times essentially 11,000, okay? And this ends up being 1.08 times 10 to the eighth, right? So this is one times 10 to the fifth plus 1.08 times 10 to the eighth Pascals, Pascals. And this ends up being a whopping 1,069 atmospheres. If you took this number, if you divide 1.08 times 10 to the eighth Pascals and divide it by 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth, you see that you get basically something one times 10 to the third, right? Uh, that's where that little 69 pops in because of the 0.08 divided by the 0.01. Um, but yeah, if you went to the deepest part of the ocean on Earth, it would be as if the atmospheric pressure was a thousand and seventy times greater than the surface of the Earth, at the surface of the Earth. It would crush you. Divers, um, a little bit next, we're going to talk about common um, water pressure that, you, that you're used to and air pressure that you're actually used to, but that would crush things. Um, there's a great story about when Russia tried to, or the Soviet Union, sent a satellite into orbit um, about Venus and it dropped a probe into Venus to do surveys. The pressure on Venus was so great that it actually imploded. If you've never seen something implode from uh, depth, um, what I should say is if you drive up really high in the mountains and you have a bag of potato chips, you'll see it will swell up. It'll blow up like a balloon because the air pressure inside is greater than the air pressure outside. If you were to go deep down into Death Valley, you would see the opposite happen. The outside pressure would actually force the bag to deflate and could even pop it depending on how strong it was. If you dropped into the ocean, it would do the same. It would eventually rupture it. It would implode it. It would eventually implode you. Um, it's not good for divers to go too deep. If you watch the show Mythbusters, I believe they put a pig in a diving suit and did a really, really horribly gross experiment with it. Um, I'm gonna spare you the details, but it's all about pressure on the body and human body's not made to take pressure. All right, so let's talk about some pressures you're used to. Um, I hope all of you have gone swimming in a pool, a, a deep enough pool to understand what I'm gonna say next. But let's say the deep end is about seven feet in your pool. So this is, the deep end is at a depth of two meters. I should say minus two meters. I wanna know what the pressure change is at the bottom of your swimming pool. I know that when I go swimming, I can actually feel that pressure change on my ears. So let's see what it is compared to the pressure at the surface of the earth. And again, we can just put P2 is equal to P1 plus rho G Y1 minus Y2. Here, we have our swimming pool and Y1 is the surface or we're gonna say it's zero, and Y2 is negative two meters, and the pressure at the top is one atmosphere. We don't know the pressure at two, and we know that the density of water is 1,000 um, kilogram meters cubed. So let's see what this is. P2 is therefore 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, which is, uh, sorry, plus 1,000, times 9.81, y1 is zero, y2 is negative two, so this is times two. And so you can see quite easily, this is gonna be about 20,000, two times 10 is 20 times 1,000. So this will be about 1.21 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, um, which is close enough to 1.2 atmospheres. So even going to the bottom of a, a somewhat small swimming pool, they make pretty deep swimming pools, 
a swimming pool that's only seven feet deep, going to the bottom of that swimming pool, the pressure on you would increase by 20%, okay? It would be 120% of what the pressure was on the surface because there's a lot of water above you pushing down on you, being pulled towards the center of the earth. Um, it's really not that deep, and yet the human body is already starting to have trouble. In the other way, um, they talk about places like Denver and Albuquerque. A lot of people don't know Albuquerque is also a mile high. But when you go a mile high, you start having trouble breathing because the air is so thin. So let's calculate the air pressure at a mile high. And remember that a mile is 1609 meters. So we're gonna start at Y1 is zero, pressure one is one atmosphere, and we're gonna go up to where Y2 is 1609 meters and figure out what pressure two is, okay? So again, pressure two is pressure one plus rho G, Y1 minus Y2. Again, this is positive, right? So we have 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals plus, but hang on, this is going to be zero and this is going to be negative. So it's actually going to be negative rho G Y2. Okay, and this becomes 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals minus 1,000 dense, I'm sorry, not 1,000, um, density of air here is 1.2 kilograms meters cubed. So therefore this is 1.2 times 9.81 times 1609. Um, if you do this, you're gonna end up seeing that this becomes about 20,000. Um, let's do that really fast. 1609 times 9.81 times 1.2 gives me 18,900. So this ends up being about 80 or 0.8 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, which is about 0 0.8 atmospheres. So going up a mile, um, you lose 20% of the pressure on you and it starts to become hard to breathe, right? Um, I'm not saying the air's thin versus whatever, but humans have a hard time to breathe at 1.2 atmospheres, and they feel like they're being smothered at one point, I'm sorry, they have a hard time breathing at 0.8 atmospheres, and they feel the effects of high pressure on them, like their ears hurt, their chest kind of hurt at 1.2 atmospheres. Um, I should say that your chest hurts underwater because that pressure is being applied everywhere on your body not just at the points that are being pushed up, because the pressure on the water, um, something that we'll talk about next time, which is uh, Pascal's lever, hydraulic lever, but basically in a fluid, the pressure is evenly distributed to every point of the object surface. Um, so your chest actually feels that 1.2 atmosphere on it, even if you were swimming like upside down or something. Um, you feel it at every point on your surface, okay? It's not hard to understand. Um, this is about as tough as it gets using this pressure equation. You just have to be attentive to what the density of the fluid that you're talking about is and be able to figure out your variables, which is something we've been doing all along, all year. Um, get some meaningful data. The really nice thing about these pressure things is it's stuff you kind of know from experience. So you can apply your own intuition and knowledge to things to solve these problems. And they're not too hard anyway. So let's talk about how a barometer works. Um, a barometer is an instrument used to measure the air pressure outside. Um, it's different than a thermometer. A thermometer measures temperature. Barometer measures pressure. And one way we can do this is we can create a dish that, uh, let me move that over. Um, we can create a dish full of some liquid and into that we can place a tube, okay? And so this is full of some liquid and inside the tube, uh, there's also some liquid, okay? 
And on the outside, the atmospheric pressure pushes down on that fluid, pushing it up into the tube. Inside this tube, P2 is zero. We evacuate it. And then we say that this is our Y1 and this is our Y2. And we can tell based on the height um, what the pressure outside is. This is useful for finding P1. Remember we said P2 was equal to P1 plus rho G Y1 minus Y2. Well here, if we move this over, it would get a negative sign so we can just flip those. So therefore, the outside pressure is P2 plus rho G Y2 minus Y1. Simply because we moved it to the other side of the equation, it picked up a negative sign and we distributed that negative sign. If we say that Y1 is zero and we say that Y2 is H, we can get rid of this and we can simply say that it's P2 plus rho G times H. Rho is obviously going to be the fluid, right? Okay, so, and not the air, it's gonna be the fluid. If we assume that P2 is zero, we can see that whatever the atmospheric pressure is, is the density of the fluid. So the pressure of the air is the density of the fluid times G times however high it went up. Um, I'm gonna show you that with a mercury barometer in a second, but make sure you understand this really well. This is kind of everything we've done so far. This is the density of the stuff moving it's the potential energy of gravity. Therefore, it's the mass times G times H. Um, we've divided through by V. So there's no V in this. So instead of mass, we're using density, right? Um, but this is the density of whatever is moving against uh, gravity. And that is equal to the pressure that is applied, here. the force over area that is applied here gives us this change in density times gravity times height. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Tor now. In this same example, we're gonna figure out what happens when, um, what is the pressure when our thermometer, okay, goes up to Y2 is equal to, um, I should really say that, um, yeah, that Y2 goes up to 760 millimeters which is 0 0.76 meters, right? This is still, pressure two is still zero. Pressure one is what we wanna find and Y1 is zero. So we found that P1 was equal to um, P2 plus rho G Y2 minus Y1. Okay, we flipped them because we're on the other side of the equation from what we originally, originally we wrote it as um, P2 was equal to P1 uh, plus rho G Y1 minus Y2. This is this same equation, but with this term moved to the other side. So we know that Y1 is zero. We know that Y2 is positive 0.76. The density of mercury, okay, if this is full of HG, um, it turns out that the density of mercury, the metal, not the planet, as your book hilariously points out, the planet Mercury is not filled with mercury. The density of mercury is greater than water. It's actually one point, uh, sorry, 13.6 times 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed. Mercury is a liquid metal. Um, but you can see it's 13,000, so it's about 13 times heavier than water, right? Um, and we know that P2 is also zero. So the pressure when a mercury barometer rises 760 millimeters is the density of mercury, 13.6 times 10 to the third, times gravity, 9.81, times 0 0.76. And it should be no surprise at all that this ends up being one times 10 to the fifth Pascals. 
Um, in other words, when a mercury barometer is used in this way, if it rises 760 millimeters, you have one atmosphere, which is identical to the atmosphere or the pressure at the surface of the earth. Therefore, one atmosphere is 760 millimeters Hg, otherwise known as Tor. Okay, and that's where Tor comes from. It comes from the actual reading of how high the atmospheric pressure would push mercury in a um, barometer, a, va a bale that has a vacuum seal and um, marks so that you can see how high it pushes it. Why would we care about the pressure? Well, to really drive home something, firefighters need to know about the pressure at a fire. They need to know how dense the clouds are above them. So the more moisture in the air above you, the greater the air pressure on you, right? And fire behavior is dictated by pressure changes. So a mercury barometer will tell them how the pressure is changing. The pressure isn't always one atmosphere at sea level. It can change depending on how cloudy or how clear it is. Um, that's why a lot of meteorologists or weathermen are particularly interested in what the pressure is doing, if it's falling or if it's rising. It tells you a lot about what is going on above your head. But for us, um, we just need to understand how a barometer works. Another um, really nice consequence, somewhat related, is something called a YouTube. And in a YouTube, you can uh, essentially close off the top, but we can use what we already know to figure out the density of some fluid. So let's make this our zero mark, and we fill this up with water, right, to some H. So this is Y2 on the right-hand side is H, and Y1 on the right-hand side is zero. And the density over here is water, and that's 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Over here, we see that Y2 is... Um, four thirds eighths, let's say. And Y1 is again zero. This is some kind of time called the interface level. And this fluid is all oil, okay? And we don't know what the density of this oil is. So on this side, right, we have that P1 is equal to P2 plus, okay, um, and on this side, we have the same equation. Now the difference here is, between these two things, is that they have a different Y2 and they have a different density. But they have the same pressure at this interface, here and here. Therefore, if we set on the right side, we set the pressure to of the oil plus the density of the oil times G, times y2 minus y1, and we set this y1 to be our zero point, we have that this is equal to the pressure to of the water plus the density of the water times g times y2 minus y1 for the water, right? And this is again zero. Um, but the pressure to is just one atmosphere if these U2s are open or if they are evacuated at zero. Whatever it is, these are the same and they cancel. So what we see is we get the density of the oil times G times Y2 for the oil, which was, I'm just gonna call it the height of the oil, is equal to the density of water times G times the height of the water. And if we wanna know what the density of the oil is, the Gs also cancel. It's simply the height of the water divided by the height of the oil times the density of water. Um, in this case, if the height of the oil was four thirds, I would get H over four thirds H, which I would get three fourths times the density of water. And that would be 3000 divided by four, which is 750 kilogram per meter cube. So I could see that this, um, this oil had to go higher, it has to have less density than the water in order for them to balance. So what you have 
is you basically have the oil and the water. And if the oil is higher than the water, the oil is less dense, okay? It has to have more gravitational potential energy, which means it has to go higher. Um, if the water is higher than the oil, then the oil is more dense than the water. So a simple experiment you can do to find the density of an object, not just the weight. You could weigh a cup of water and a cup of oil and find their mass, but then using this, you could find the ratio of their densities, okay? And by computing those, you could figure out um, exactly what the density is of the oil using that the density of water is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. <clears throat> Pretty good stuff for doing experiments, um, for figuring out quantities in a lab. It's not too hard to figure out. Um, it ends up being, like I said, that the density on the right times the height on the right is equal to the density on the left times the height on the left if you measure from the interface, right? And that problem is shown in your book. It's a pretty simple problem that I think you can all understand. Uh, it would be a good little quiz problem. Uh, but otherwise, we're all good. You can also see that if this was full of, of water and fruit punch, that the fruit punch would be right there if somehow you could um, separate the two. You also have to be able to separate the two, and that's why they always use oil and water, because if they were both water-based, they would just mix and you would have this happen. Anyway, um, so our next topic is actually buoyancy and um i don't remember if we're actually going to do the buoyancy lab i think we canceled the buoyancy lab which is kind of a shame because the buoyancy lab i think is simple enough but fun enough to help reinforce the concept of buoyancy buoyancy just means how do objects float um, in water or air so we could say that a, a balloon is buoyant and we could say that, um, I don't know why. Um, I don't know why buoyancy is spelled wrong. But anyway, um, <coughs> an air balloon is buoyant in the air. Um, an object could float on the surface of the water. An object could sink a little bit down. You could have like a plastic ball that's floating halfway down in a swimming pool. Um, those are all buoyancy things. And it goes back to a guy named Archimedes, who was Greek. I'm probably going to butcher this story, but basically the story is that the king thought he was being ripped off by a jeweler who had made a crown. He didn't believe that the crown was pure gold. And yet it looked like it was pure gold. So he promised all of these riches or an appointment or whatever to whoever could figure out if the jeweler was cheating him. And supposedly Archimedes was taking a bath and thinking through this problem, and he suddenly realized that if he put the crown in a bucket of water, let's say, the amount of water that spilled out would be equal to the density of the crown. And therefore he could easily check versus the density of pure gold whether the crown was pure gold. And that's what we're gonna look at. You can figure out the density of an object by whether it floats in water or sinks or rises, right? Um, that's what Archimedes figured out. This all comes down to one simple fact or definition, that the buoyant force has to be equal to the mass of water times G. The weight of water times g which we already know is <clears throat> the density of water times the volume of water times g the buoyancy is the amount of water displaced by the object um, kind of hard to understand but essentially if i'm underwater and i have a ball right with some mass and some volume Okay, that ball is taking up an equal amount of water with the same volume, but a different mass, right? Um, so basically, 
the density times the volume of the object has to be equal to the density times the volume of the water. And we'll talk about that in a minute and prove that in a minute. But basically, mass takes up the same amount of space as some amount of water. And if that mass has less density, if that mass is less dense than the water it is replacing, it shoots up. It's like they want to go where the density is equalized. And if that mass has a greater density than water, it sinks. Um, and we'll show that right now why. Um, but if they're equal, then the mass has to have, if it's not moving at all, if it's not sinking, it's not rising, then you know the mass has the same density as water. Okay, so we're gonna start with just a static submerged object. Let's say a ball, right? We know that it has a force of buoyancy up and we know that it has a weight down and we're gonna pretend like it's in water, okay? We'll talk about whether, what would happen if this was air, like a balloon in air, but has a force up, a buoyancy and a weight down. Let's say A is up, MA is zero is the buoyant force minus the weight, okay? Now, the weight of the object is the mass of the object times G, which is the density of the object times the volume of the object times G. And the buoyant force is equal to the mass of the water displaced, which is the density of the water times the volume of the water times G. But the volume of the object and the volume of the water have to be equal. An object that places the same amount of volume as itself. Therefore, this says that Fb is equal to the weight, or the density of water times the volume of water is equal to the density, I'm sorry, the density of the object times the volume of the object is equal to times g. It's equal to the density of water times the volume of water times g. And from this, since V0 and Vw are the same, you get that the density has to be the same as the density of water. Right, That is completely unhelpful, other than an observation that an object floats when its density matches the water. So we could basically figure out the density of water an object floating here would have a density you know, of whatever. A floating object floating here would be different. I already said that we're assuming a universal dens density for water. We're not really anymore because the density of water at one and the density of water at two will be different. And therefore, say a rubber ball might float here, but a, a aluminum ball might float here or something, right? Wherever its density matches the density of water at that level, that's where it's going to float. Um, so what happens if it's not static? This is assuming it's floating, but how do we figure out what to do if it's not floating. For instance, we bring an object with us underwater and we have it in our hand and we release it. And we don't know whether it's going to sink or rise. So from the same equations, it has a buoyant force and it has a weight and it has A. And we need to figure out what will happen to A. So MA of the object, remember, is the density of the object times the volume of the object times A. And that's equal to the buoyant force minus the weight. So we have the density of the object times the volume of the object is equal to the density of water times the volume of the water times G minus the density of the object times the volume of the object times G. Okay. We're going to keep those Gs. We can't cancel them this time because it doesn't equal zero. And we get that A is equal to the density of water times the volume of water divided by the density of the object times the volume of the object minus density. Okay. Remembering that again, the volume of the object is equal to the volume of the water displaced. So this becomes simply the density of the water divided by the density of the object, I don't know why I wrote G, minus one times G. And we can see that if the density of water is greater than the density of the object, so if 
density of water is greater than the density of the object, um, then greater than one time, right? So this would have to be something bigger than one. We get a positive A and it shoots up, it rises to the surface. However, if the density of water is less than the density of the object, A is negative and it sinks. That's what this equation is telling us. That's what Archimedes, in a way, was telling us, is that objects sink because their density is greater than the density of the um, same amount of water that they replace. Objects rise because their density is less than the water that they replace. It's the same thing in air. If this is a balloon, so let's say you take a balloon and you fill it with some helium that has less that's less dense than normal air, then the balloon will rise until it reaches a level where the pressure or the density of the air is equal to the density of the helium inside the balloon. Um, that's why balloons float in the air, because the density inside them is less than the density outside. Kind of weird, um, but totally true. And um, just really odd, odd stuff, um, cool stuff. If you think too hard about it, it will make your brain hurt a little bit. But basically, all the way up to the top of the atmosphere, to the core of the Earth, we're like a seven layer dip, and you settle to the layer where your density matches the density of everything else. So everything kind of piles to the core and gets less and less dense, the further away from the center of the earth you move. Um, kind of cool, kind of weird, kind of hard to imagine in some respects, but um, definitely, definitely a cool idea. Um, Archimedes was really smart. Um, we have two more examples to go with this. Um, the big one is a partially submerged object. This is where things start to get a little bit more difficult. So imagine in the ocean, there's a box floating, okay? And the box is half submerged. So the, the box is submerged in the water. And the box initially has some area at the top and bottom, but it has some height h. And the water level is at some height h and the bottom of the box is at zero. So the water goes up to h and the top of the box is at h. And the box has an area of a, okay? Now the buoyancy for a static, meaning not moving, partially submerged objects. Again, we know that ma was equal to the buoyant force minus the weight and we know this is zero if it's static. So the buoyant force is equal to the weight here. And the buoyant force was the density of the water times the volume of the water times g is equal to the density of the object times the volume of the object times g. But now the volume of the water is the area times little h. And the volume of the object is the area times big h. Even though big h is out of the water, the amount of water displaced is only a times little h. The object itself has a volume though of a big h. So getting rid of g, we see that this is pw. A times little h is equal to rho, I said p, but I meant rho of water, the density of water times the area times little h, the density of the object times area times big h, and therefore we see that the density of the object is equal to the height of the water line divided by the height that the object, the actual height of the object times the density of water. So if H was half of, if H was equal to half of H, then we would see that this object had a density of half the density of water. That's why it's floating because it's out of the water because its density is greater than water. If H and H were equal, then it would have the same density as water, right? Um, 
So styrofoam, which has a tenth the density, let's say, of water, would float so that only um, a tenth of it was out of the water, right? Little h would be one tenth. Okay. That's kind of cool that you can mathematically describe an object that's floating. But what do we do when it's uh, not static? So it's partially submerged, but we don't know if it's going to rise or fall. Well, everything we just did is the same, except we now have this MA, um, which is equal to the density of water times um, the area times the height that it's coming out minus the density of the object times the area times the height of the object, right? And therefore, this M is again volume um, times density times A. So this is equal to um, B, uh, sorry, A times uh, big H times A. And we see that A is going to be the density um, of the water times A times H minus the density of the object times A times, uh, I need to go back and make that a little h. All times G divided by the density of the object times A times big H, right? So this, if we cancel some stuff off, we get <clears throat> that the density of water times H over the density of the object times big H minus one is equal to G. Um, therefore, it, the density times the amount of the object sticking out of the water, the height that the object sticks out of the water, divided by the density of the object times H. If um, the density of water times the height that it sticks out of the water, or the, the amount, the height that it's submerged in the water, I should say, is greater than the actual height of the object, then we see that it rises, right? And Obviously, it sinks if the other thing is true because you get a negative number. Um, that's not too hard to understand. I just wanted to show you how to compute it in case you have a question to do uh, for homework or an exam question. Okay. Um, but that's not too tough either. If you took physics in high school, you've probably actually done this already. Um, this stuff isn't too hard, it's pretty easy and it's fun. Um, and there's a fun historical story about Archimedes in it. But um, the next part, next time, what we're gonna do is a little bit more involved and more um, elegant physics, but we're actually gonna find we already know how it works. Um, basically, we're gonna take the idea of energy and we're gonna use it to determine the fluid flow of water through pipes and things like that and determine how the velocity that the water would leave with it's tricky it's got a few little um, hills to climb that aren't mathematical they're they're reasoning um, problems but we'll talk about that next time um, one thing i did want to highlight about this is um, <clears throat> so later on this week, we're going to have a quiz on Kepler orbits. Uh, just so you know, that should be able to tell me uh, like the semi-major axis and the period or something of, of, a, of a planet, tell me its eccentricity or something like that. I'll come up with something simple, but using Kepler's equations, uh, much like the Halley Comet problem in the lecture. Uh, I also wanted to say that next time when we're talking about fluids, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what is an ideal fluid. And an ideal fluid, um, 
basically there's a lot of things about fluids that we can't model effectively. And it's not because we can't, it's because no one can. Um, fluid mechanics is governed by something called the Navier-Stokes Navier equations. They tell you how to solve the differential equations that govern the motion of fluid. And there's something called the Millennium Prize. It's seven different topics in math that if you solve them, they give you a million dollars. One of those is the solution to the smoothness question of Navari Stokes. Um, basically, fluid mechanics is hard and proving unsolvable. We can do a lot of computer modeling and get good answers, but to do actual non ideal fluid mechanics is ridiculously hard. Um, so, we're going to talk about why it's hard and why we use ideal fluids and what that means next time. Then we're going to talk about something called Pascal's hydraulic lever. If you've ever used a hydraulic jack, it's how can you magnify a force using fluid and pressure? How pressure can be used as a lever, in a sense. Um, it's a really, really simple concept, really simple mathematical concept, but really, really cool. Um, and then finally, as I said, we're going to talk about Bernoulli's equations of ideal fluid flow and a couple of little related equations. It is going to seem a lot like energy when we get energy. You're going to find the pressure, you're going to find the velocity, and you're going to find the height of the fluid at one point, find it again at another point, set those two things equal, and determine information. There's a couple of auxiliary equations that help us do that, because obviously that would have a bunch of unknowns. Um, but it's nothing too hard. It's actually uh, the hurdles are um, kind of just in the way we frame the questions, and we'll talk about that next time. So please read the part about Bernoulli's equations. In fact, please read a few of the questions or examples on using Bernoulli's equation and see if it starts to make sense to you. It's one of those things that you, you'll look at it and think you get it, and then you'll confuse yourself, and then you'll think you get it, and then you'll just not be sure. Um, so we'll talk about a few of those problems. We're gonna spend most of the time on that. Um, the hydraulic lever stuff is really fast and easy to learn, and the ideal fluid stuff is just some information. So anyway, um, I hope you're all healthy. I hope the test wasn't too bad. I hope everyone found it interesting. I'm, uh, I graded my other classes test and hopefully I'll grade yours. If I have some time tonight, if I don't get sucked into other things, I'll work on it. Otherwise I'll work on it all day tomorrow. Um, but yeah, hope everyone's happy and healthy. We've only got one more chapter. We've got three more video lectures and material to cover. And um, I'm gonna post a solution to the homework problems for you um, from last week, this week, and the second part of this lecture. And then next week is pendulums and um, oscillations. I'm going to take you through oscillations as differential equations. You won't have to solve them, but I'll show you how we get the equations out of the differential equations. So for those of you that already have differentials, you might enjoy it. For those of you who haven't had it yet, you're going to find that they're not too bad. And hopefully this will be the first time you get to do real differential equations. Um, not do it, I'll do it, but um, see it done and understand why we're doing differentials. Um, anyway, hope everyone's happy and healthy. Hopefully this is, we're on the downside of this and before we know it, we'll all be back in classes and able to talk and see each other. Anyway, um, talk to you all later, bye.